Hello. Good evening. It's lovely to see you all here. Hi. Uh, a special welcome to our, our radio listeners on Principia Internet Radio. Um, they'll be listening in throughout the night, and um, we'd like to invite them to submit any questions they have later on during the presentation to talk.radio at principia.edu. Um, again, that's talk.radio at principia.edu. It's a, a pleasure to have such a global audience tonight. Um, so yeah, good evening. Um, I'd like to, um, yeah, it gives me really great pleasure, actually, to, to introduce two people who've achieved quite, quite phenomenal success in their respective fields, um, Robert and Helen Ellswick. Um, Robert and Helen have both enjoyed really rich careers in the film business. Robert is a cinematographer, and Helen is a special effects coordinator and producer. Helen's work has included Master and Commander, A Perfect Storm, both of which received Academy Award nominations for their special effects. She also worked on the groundbreaking family movie Space Jam, which I remember. Um, I mean, it, pretty awesome, right? Um, outside the film world, Helen serves the Principia community as a trustee uh, and worked particularly tirelessly, tirelessly towards resolution during the leadership challenges of 2007. That said, um, tonight's focus is really on film and her trustee hat hanging up in the guest house somewhere. So let's, let's save that one for another time. Uh, Robert's film career began at the special effects powerhouse uh, Industrial Light and Magic, uh, where he worked as an effects cameraman on films such as Star Trek, the motion picture, um, The Empire Strikes Back, uh, it's another one you might remember, and uh, E.T., the extraterrestrial. Um, his work as a cinematographer and director of photography has since gone from strength to strength, uh, including a recent Oscar win for There Will Be Blood um, and a previous nomination for Good Night and Good Luck. Other standout films include Michael Clayton, which we screened on campus last weekend, and my personal favorite film, Magnolia. Tonight's presentation will take the form of an interview. I'm going to kick things off with a couple of questions, but then I'm really just going to open things up to you. Um, there are mics in the aisles, and uh, as soon as I see people lurking with questions, we'll turn things over. Thank you. All right, so it's Oscar season. Um, you guys are members of the Academy. Um, Robert is a member of the Academy. You're, you're a member of the Academy. Uh -huh. Any idea where your votes are going? Uh, Helen always ah. votes. <laughs> I don't vote. Helen, Helen does all the voting. I let him give me a clue as to who he would vote for for cinematography, though. But, but Helen votes for everything else. That's what we discuss it a little bit. <laughs> Sometimes. It's very democratic. Yeah. I like that. All right. Um, so I'm sure there are a lot of people in the audience who, who love, love film, love watching film. Um, maybe feel a real passion for film, but don't really know what that means or what they can do with that or where to take it. Um, how, Helen, how did you get involved in filmmaking? That's a loaded question. <laughs> um, well, when I was little, I, my family lived in Nebraska and my father and my grandfather had a movie theater and I'd totally forgotten about this. I mean, I hadn't forgotten about it, but I hadn't really made the connection that my love for film went that far back until the last year or so, and it all of a sudden made complete sense to me because I spent many hours of my childhood, and I have siblings in the audience tonight that can say the same thing. We spent many hours in that, that little movie theater in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. So fast forward a few years when I was a lawyer practicing law in Kansas City, and just um, noticed that I was always reading the arts and leisure section of the paper first when everybody else, all of my colleagues were reading the business section and was feeling a real kind of creative lack in my working life and just at that time a movie came to Kansas City. It was the first feature picture that was ever mm -hmm. made in, in Kansas City and the city was all abuzz and we were all excited and we knew it was going to be a closed set and that no one was going to be allowed on the set. It was uh, the, um, the company that made it was a company called Merchant Ivory, and I had been such a huge admirer of their films. And um, <clears throat> the movie was to star 
Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward, and I was a huge fan of Paul Newman's and Joanne Woodward's. So um, when they uh, put an ad in the paper for hiring local technicians, um, I didn't think there was a prayer for me, but I just one day was sitting in my office and just thought I would kill myself if I didn't, if I let this opportunity go by and didn't at least give them the opportunity to say, no, you're crazy. So I went down to their production office and um, said, I know nothing about film, but I want to learn about filmmaking and uh, do anything to be on the set. And uh, is there anything that I can do? And uh, they said, well, we, we, we need a driver. So that's how I started out as Paul Newman's driver. <laughs> and you know, the interesting thing about that is, had I decided at that moment, which I was actually the story is a little bit longer because I really had kind of, um, you know, been searching my heart and listening to that spiritual intuition, which I am very much a fan of, um, and it has guided me in many ways throughout my life. But I was really trying to listen to know what my next step should be, and it was coming to me over and over again that I wanted to be in this creative field and that I loved film. And had I left Kansas City at that moment and moved to where everybody goes or thinks they need to go to Los Angeles to get in the film business, I probably would not be sitting before you today as someone who's been in that business. It took being in Kansas City, which was a right to work state where they could actually hire a driver who was not a teamster to start on her first film and, and meet people that were able to help me with my career when I finally did go to Los Angeles. So that's how I got started. Start in Kansas City. In Kansas City, where everything's up to date. Cool. But what about you? Do you know that reference? I don't, actually. Everything's, it's actually a film reference. Everything's up to date in Kansas City. Do you know that film reference? It's Oklahoma. There you go. I, who sings it? <laughs> Anybody know who sings it? Will. Character's name is Will. Yes. Wasn't Gordon Big McRae? musical theater right. buff. There'll be a quiz. <laughs> he can sing all the lyrics to every Gilbert and Sullivan song I'm ever written. I'm just curious okay. whose idea the green plant was. <laughs> Said like a real cinematographer. It was, I don't is know it if stealing anybody, the light or something, If Darl? anybody noticed the water theme, all the, move, all, this, all, the, all the shots with water in the clips, this is, oh, it's, it's. Robert, what are you doing? <laughs> that's David's water you're taking. Well, well that's, that's okay. I've, I, the plant probably needs it more than I do. Because we actually. You know, we've been talking a lot today. I think Robert has just kind of gone off. But did anybody know, it's, it's um, Helen and I met on the River Wild. And uh, we met in Boston, the opening title sequence of the movie, where Meryl Streep is rowing the uh, single skull um, that, and that's actually her doing it a lot of it it's, it's certainly Meryl not me Meryl <laughs> and and Helen was uh, hired initially to be because uh, it was a, one little part of the movie was shot in Boston the rest of it was in uh, in Montana and Wyoming and, and Oregon and Helen was only hired to do the part in Boston to uh, coordinate to production manage sort of line produce that title sequence which was just that shooting on the river with Meryl Streep and so I, I saw her for the first time there. I thought she was just fantastic. And, uh, and I accidentally, s I think what, my, my memory is that I kind of, I, I went to dailies, I looked at, which just means I was looking at footage from the days, previous day's work, and I ended up leaving my favorite jacket in the screening room, and I ended up calling the production office and saying, you know, I left my jacket. And uh, I don't want to put words in my mouth. I knew was going to be high maintenance from was, then on. <laughs> Ever since, ever since that time, Helen, I've been, I mean, that's the nature of, in many ways, still the nature of our relationship. I call Helen up and I have a problem. And, but so, but that's, how, that's how we met and that's why that, that movie has such a, a special uh, meaning to us. And actually, after that, the director was a very good friend of mine. Um, they needed someone to do, uh, she wasn't actually, she was the production coordinator on the movie. They, they needed another production coordinator because it's a very complicated film. And uh, Curtis Hansen, who was the director, 
suggested Helen. <laughs> so actually, and he takes responsibility for, uh, for our he marriage. still does for, uh, for us actually. I think rightfully so. Yeah, I do too. I do too. Um, I'm sorry, what was the question? What was the question? I, I'm not sure there was one. I think you just okay, started watering the plant. <laughs> um, but it, it led us interesting places, so that's good. Um, I, I suppose there, there are, I, I maybe underestimate the audience, but there are probably a few people who aren't completely clear on what the different roles within a film production are. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what cinematography means and what, in a shot like we just saw of a, a burning oil rig falling or you know, all of these things, what, which bits of that are you responsible um, for? Well, the, the job primarily is one, um, the cinematographer in the, at the very beginning of the movie business was really just the person who cranked the camera, which is how actually the film moved through the camera at the very beginning of the movie business. Um, and it slowly evolved because the films became more complicated and more technically sophisticated when artificial lighting became predominantly the, the source of light in movies, which was really in the middle of the silent era. The primary job of the cinematographer became lighting, not so much, um, to some extent, still design, setting up the shot, deciding on lens and distance, and designing the images as they move one to the next and they flow through the film. Um, but lighting is still the primary responsibility as director of photography. Um, sometimes the DP, as they call them, or her, would actually operate the camera. DP standing for director, director of photography. photography. is something I do on most films. Um, but the primary job is really, is really lighting and working out with the director, and, 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 and also as part of that, depends on the director, and depends on the nature of the relationship, but you're also helping design the, the look of the film in terms of just what the shots are, what the sizes, the image sizes are, what the setups are, what, what the actual shots are that you make, and that are sort of, um, and in coordination with the production designer, um, what locations are selected to shoot in, and the nature of uh, what the sets are that are built. That you're actually, if there are sets, um, and there will be blood, everything in that film was uh, a built set. All the all the exterior outbuildings that you see in the movie, from the oil rig to the town to each of the homes, everything in that movie was built by a, a brilliant production designer named Jack Fisk. Um, Mary to Sissy Spacek. Mary to Sissy Spacek, and. Uh, with the exception of there's a mansion at the end, which is actually a real, the Doheny Mansion in Los Angeles. But, so it's, it's, that's the primary responsibility. People don't really understand that, but it is lighting the set. Um, so in that it. last shot where the Derek is. The Derek was, I actually lit the Derek. No, I didn't. Um, <laughs> the other part but they, of it. But they had one shot. I mean, they built that Derek, and they had, how many cameras did you have going on I think that? We had, I think we had five cameras, but. Because they had. It's the one nature. Chance it's to an, get that shot. We we actually didn't. We were hoping we had more than one chance, but the the guy who directed the film, Paul Thomas Anderson, is a very um, he's a director who hopes that um, life will that movies will come to life if accidents occur. And there's a certain amount of planning, but some of it he hopes will just be serendipitous. There'll be something. And one of the things he 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 would do, which he did in this instance, which no other director would do, was we were told if we started this fire that even though the wood on the derrick was treated, that it might just burn out of control. And there was no way for us to control the fire once it started. The original plan was we put the fire out and we'd slowly shoot the fire burning over a period of two days, actually, three days. And we were warned by the special effects people and everyone else, the rig had sat out there for months and months and the fire treating the wood was probably dry, very, very dry. And it was a good shot, a good chance that we would ever be able to put, we would start and that would be it. And there was a little tiny fire department from the little tiny town where we were shooting, which consisted of a pumper truck and four, four people. And that wasn't gonna put out the bar. And, and so, no source of water any, any yeah, nearby. Yeah, it, it, was, it was a bad idea. And again, it's, it's, a, it's who Paul is. Paul is just unique that way. And he just said, you know what, let's just see what happens. And what happened is the whole thing burned down. And we, we really- Unfortunately, had five cameras rolling barely really, really got it. And we didn't get it the way we hoped we'd get it. But um, organizing the, in, in, a, in a day exterior scene, I guess, which is going back to the real question, what do I do? Uh, it, helping somebody like Paul figure out what the setups are so they'll cut together. But in something like this, it's also being responsible for the technical part of where the cameras are, how they're set up, 
and, and it's still motion picture film. Sometimes, some of us are still shooting motion picture film, and, uh, which has to be sort of exposed correctly. And so I have a light meter. I use that. And that's about it. But It's not very hard what he does but, at all. <laughs> and, and actually, it, I, I mean, it really isn't. It's, uh, the technical part really isn't that difficult. And uh, um, it's something that... Uh, anybody uh, I mean, can do. It, it is. It's something anybody can do. <laughs> Helen's making a joke, but it's true. It is really something anybody can do. It's not really that complex. Um, but I think what happens... Um, in a movie like this is it just, uh, it takes on other qualities because it's, it's a complicated bit of staging. So in something that's that, that involves that many people, that much activity, and something as big as something burning to the ground, then there is kind of a, a planning part of the process that becomes very, very important. So I'm involved in that initially, and then finally when we're shooting it, and hoping that uh, we actually, nothing goes wrong and nothing breaks, that sort of thing. Okay. That? That's great. The plant is driving me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Just ignore the plant. Right. What, uh, what, about, what about special effects? Because you're not actually making special effects. Where, no. How, how uh, did you get into that, and what, what role were you serving in that? Like, I in that got space into jam it by a man who, a producer that I had worked with for two weeks on a little reshoot, and we had hit it off. And when he started another film, he called me in and I, she said, can you help me out on this? And I said, Duncan, I'll do anything. I'd love to work with you again. And he said, well, I want you to do the visual effects. And I said, the what? And he said, oh, you went to law school. You can figure it out. Okay. Seriously, that's how I got started. And that, that movie was a movie called Outbreak, which I'm sure every good Christian scientist has seen. It's all about disease. And well, um, Actually, there were some wonderful object lessons on that film. Um, which I won't go into now, but uh, it, uh, so I learned on the job, basically, and there were, there were a few shots in that, um, you know, maybe 14 shots, I think, that we did that were visual effects shots, and I learned the language, and it was also a time when that movie was made, it wasn't as though every film today, every, almost every film you see has some version of a visual effects in it effect in it, whether it's one shot or a hundred shots, there's usually something that a director wants to fix in post. Those are my favorite words on a set. Oh, we'll fix it in post. And I'm thinking, ka-ching, 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 because it's very, very expensive to include visual effects in your film. And so I was one of the first um, producers in visual effects. Um, there was a woman ahead of me, Pam Easley, who hired me to follow her on, um, after I did that film, sh I, I took over for her on Space Jam, that Michael Jordan film that you saw the clip from. And I just learned on the, on the fly. And that's how I got started. And, and visual effects, for the, there's, there's a difference between visual effects and special effects. Special effects are all of those things that happen on the, on the day that you're filming. So they're called in-camera effects. So it's for instance, an explosion that special effects people set up and you roll camera and you actually get that in real time. The, the, spe the visual effects would be if you took that same footage and digitized it and put it into the computer and then you enhanced that explosion in the computer or you added water or you, you know, I mean, all of the perfect storm was one big computer generated effect. And I, and I was going to say that one of the clips you saw from Master and Commander was uh, those boats shooting at each other. And I think everybody thinks those are probably real boats and, and, uh, or, because it, it's incredibly well done. And those are boats that Helen, uh, that were one-eighth scale, that Helen shot in Many New years. Zealand against blue screen, and there's only one of them. And they doubled as two. And there's not a real boat in that movie. There well... There is a, a real boat, boat that they're standing on, but all those wide shots of those boats firing at each other are not, are the, they're miniature boats that were shot against a blue screen in which the water elements were all composited later in the computer. So there was, they were shot, not all, the whole image was put together in a computer, but Helen went to New Zealand and all those images were designed there and shot there to be played back later as part of that sequence. And I think one of the things that's so, when it's done that well, it's invisible. You don't think it's a visual effect shot. It doesn't feel like Space Jam or 
an outer space movie and you know there wasn't a camera there. I think everybody who sees that, uh, Master and Commander, uh, it's so impressive that I think it's overlooked. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing piece. Well, thank you, darling. Can <laughs> I wish I could take credit for the actual artwork in the film, but I, I hire the companies in, again, going back to your question, I'll work with the director to see what kinds of visual effects or what the thinking is in, in his or her mind, and then I'll be instrumental in hiring the company that will then execute the visual effects and then um, just make sure that they're producing what the director is expecting and that they're doing it on time and on budget. So that's what I do. Bringing it all together. Bringing it all together. Cool. So someone like me who spends a lot of time watching movies instead of doing their homework and even <laughs> more time wishing that they were making movies. And than doing your homework? Than doing, right. Um, unless my homework is a movie, which oh. it, is sometimes. Um, where do I go with that? What do, do I go to film school? Do I just keep doing it on my own? And do you I know, go to I've Kansas threatened City? for the last two or three years to make a documentary about mm -hmm. how people get started in the film business. I think people might be fascinated with it because we get asked the question all the time, but the point of it being that every single person I know has a different story of how they got started in the film business. and. Some people went to film school. Most people that I work with did not go to film school. They had a passion for film. They maybe had a friend involved, but many times didn't know anybody involved. And their passion was the driving force, and they found any, any way they could to get involved in film. And I think um, I was saying this to you earlier today that Oftentimes when people ask me about, well, what can I do? How can I get into the film business? I often discourage them and just say, I don't think, you know, it's possible because if they're really passionate about doing it, they won't listen to me. But if they listen to me, then they don't really have the requisite amount of passion to <laughs> make it in the film business. So if I discourage you, that's just a clue. Don't, you know, let me get away with it if you're really passionate about it. But now you've given that away. So no I, know I, have, I know I have. I know I have. But, uh, you know, there just isn't one way. Um, and it's a very, very competitive business. So um, it tends to be those people who are driven and also a little bit crazy that end up in it. You know, it's, it's a wacky business and it's not very glamorous. You know, you think it's this wonderful glamorous business where you're hanging out with movie stars all the time and that's just not at all what my experience has been. Robert hangs out with movie stars. Mine's the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Old, old glamour? It's pretty much just hanging out with movie stars. <laughs> well, you know, any smart movie star is really nice to the cinematographer because that's who makes that's them look right. good or bad yeah, up right. there on that big screen. That's I remember right. Meryl Streep took a big liking to Robert on the River Wild. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> and we weren't you were married enamored at the time, with me. So, uh, so you, you started work, Robert, in actually in visual effects. I did, in the old-fashioned version of visual the, effects. The old-fashioned version of that. Um, how did you move from, from I guess, the Well, the I wasn't background. really very good at visual effects. That, was, that helped. And, and it was something that I did really because I went to work for a small company that actually did the simulations for NASA, if you can believe this. They used to simulate NASA and JPL's um, uh, satellite launches with little miniature satellites and little miniature planets. And this is, you know, long before anything was, even anyone had even imagined you could do these things in a computer. So they were all done photochemically with miniature objects, three-dimensional planes, and it's the way they'd done visual effects in movies since they started making movies where they take a, an actual, they make a miniature version of something and photograph it in some sort of environment and composite it optically with what they call an optical printer and create images with multiple elements. To, but they're all shot on film and they're usually a combination of large scale things and small scale things. And I worked for a company that had the, the, the uh, contract with JPL. And so whenever you'd watch the news and they'd say JPL launched a satellite, you'd see this thing floating through the sky and it was like, so it, and that then was I got, and then, yeah, it was me. And then, uh, and after the original Star Wars was made, 
there was all of a sudden an enormous rush in the business to make movies like Star Wars. And Star Trek, the movie, the original one that Robert Wise directed, went into production. And Lucas made another movie, and there were several others. And so there was a, all of a sudden, people who had a vague idea of how to do this got jobs, which I did. I was completely unqualified for. And I got, ended up being taken up to ILM by a cameraman, I, I, a wonderful guy. And I just was, uh, it was like being the dumbest guy in, if you have this experience I did in high school, the dumbest guy in physics class, for instance, <coughs> that's what I was. And I, I bumbled around there, but I think uh, I worked for a couple of truly brilliant people and I learned a lot, not about visual effects, but more about filmmaking. Which, and that was the great part of that experience. And I had no real interest in visual effects. It was just the place I got a job. I, I love narrative films. It's what I've loved since I was a little kid. And I actually had a little bit of a background in the theater and in, in, in educational theater in, in college. And I wanted to be in theatrical motion pictures, but that was just where I started. And finally, they realized that, I, that uh, they should get rid of me, and they did. That was great. That is that's not sort of, true. It's kind of what happened, actually. They pretend it's not now, but that's pretty much what it was. Uh, but I did work. I, I got to see some truly, really, really brilliant people do that work. And uh, it's one of those strange parts of the business that changed completely. It went from being almost a handmade craft, really, to, uh, to doing what you guys do, to going down and sitting in front of a computer and reinv they reinvented modern motion picture visual effects at ILM about 20 years ago. And that's, we're all sort of reaping the benefit. Anybody who does Photoshop, anyone who does things online or looks at digital Im or manipulates images or anything, that all started with about 25 people at ILM in about 1978, 1979. Um, and, they're par and part of that is um, what Helen was saying about movies now, where every film has visual effects in it. They really do, they're always, there's something that, probably in almost every movie, there's one element, whether it's changing the uh, background slightly or getting rid of something that's objectionable in the frame, it's so easy to do now that it's kind of become part of every movie, even if it isn't a visual effects movie. And in a weird way, it's almost become cost effective to do it that way, rather it, than it, take it, another half day to reshoot something that, that yeah, was, it's, it saves you know, It saves shots, it saves time, it does all sorts of things. And there's a, a, another secret uh, which I probably shouldn't talk about, but I will anyway because it's so juicy. Actually, is that um, we talk about oh, Meryl no, Streep? Meryl shouldn't talk about that. No, I shouldn't. <laughs> no, they want to. No, I should talk about. It. No one else. You won't say anything, right? So, how many people have seen Mamma Mia? By the way, that's great. All right, I love that movie. Um, there are more visual effects in Mamma Mia than in Iron Man. Okay, <laughs> and those visual effects all have to do with the way Meryl Streep looks. Well, she's laughing all the way to the Academy Awards for Dallas. Well, I'm not talking about she Dallas. Care I'm talking about Mamma Mia. No, I'm not kidding. But it's not, it's not Meryl Streep's fault or anything like that. But now we really are able to go in in post-production uh, when a film is being completed and do what you can essentially, what all, everybody who does Photoshop knows how to do. Those unsightly blemishes, those lines, those wrinkles, those things that were just not quite perfect about those photos you took, and you go into Photoshop and you can play with the pixels. Well, we do that in motion pictures now. And on certain movies, you don't bother, but I'll, it's um, the only way you could sit through Sex in the City, I'll tell you right now, if you've seen that. <laughs> because I saw the original footage, and uh, <clears throat> a lot of work. Yeah. Good to know. Uh, is this a question hanging out right here? Let's take a question. I can't imagine that you have a question, Clark. I, I do, Helen. But actually, it's for Robert. I, I, I have a comment first, which is we were all rooting for you, at least certainly our family was rooting for you last year at the Academy Awards, and we were delighted. You. Uh, when you when you got that award, and was very relieved when you finally mentioned Helen at the end of your <laughs> remark. I asked him not to. <laughs> That's not true. If someone gave me a a glass that says on it, and Helen, <laughs> as, a, as a gift, we have two of them. They say and Helen. 
It, it should, however, have been your second Academy Award because I don't think I've seen a modern film more poetically beautiful than Good Night and Good Luck, and that was cinematography. Um, so, I agree. <laughs> um, at any rate, I guess my question, I have a twofold question. Um, one, can you describe, um, it would seem to me, since the DP has such a, an impact on the look of the film, that your relationship with each individual director has to be tremendously important. And I'm wondering, have you ever been on a, on a shoot in which you and the director have had radically different visual ideas and then directors with whom you've worked particularly well? And then the other question I have is, who are your favorite cinematographers? Oh, that's a good question. Um, we, we actually talked about this earlier. It, it's really, it, it, you really don't want to be in that situation. I mean, if you don't get along personally, that's one. But if you don't, usually you're not on a film where you haven't had a long discussion before you've started the movie or before you've been hired, where you've talked in very specific ways about what the film's going to be. So you're usually in agreement. You're hired, if you're a cinematographer, you're hired by the director. And that initially, if you've never worked with a person before, there's usually a, um, a kind of a long interview. Um, and you sit down and you talk for all, you've read the script and you discuss your ideas and their ideas and, and somehow come to, uh, and, and usually they've seen something of yours that they liked and they responded to, and that's why they've asked you to meet with them. So it usually doesn't, I mean, it hasn't happened to me that way. Um, I think what happens when things go wrong is the pressures that directors are under create problems for you if things take too long, uh, there's a huge time and money issue in making movies, or if things just don't look right or don't look the way they want, and there are all these, and this is something that happens on every movie. There's always a moment or there's some scene, or there's a... Or if Christian Bale gets really mad at you. <laughs> it's a, a great take. It's a, it's a really, and, and that's actually a very interesting, um, you know, just cinematographers get fired. They get fired because actors are unhappy with them. They get fired because directors are unhappy. Studios are unhappy. I mean, uh, sooner or later, everyone gets, can get fired. I haven't been fired yet, but I know people, people who wanted to fire me, and for various reasons haven't been able to. But it was never, I was never in a director-bad director relationship. Um, Your favorite cinematographers? Uh, you know, it, it, they're, they're the classic, people working now, they're just the people we all know, I think. Um, my special um, loves, I guess, are for people you've never heard of, or really date back to the 30s, uh, some, some even earlier, um, who really invented this business and invented what we do, and they did it with bigger, giant cameras and slow lenses and slow film, and 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 uh, they were just extraordinarily talented, uh, brilliant, brilliant people. Um, in the more modern era, I'd say in the modern era, in the place when I was in film school, it's people like Owen Roisman, um, Gordon Willis, uh, Bill Mosley, and Laszlo Kovacs, all the usual people, all the usual people. But going back to a previous era. And it's something that I know a lot of film students don't really look at these movies anymore. But it would be, um, I'm not even going to say their names, but they're, they're people that I grew up, well, I grew up watching television. And I'm that age when what was on TV were movies from the 30s and 40s. And that's a big difference now. And I don't think those things play except on turning movie classics or something. So I saw films all the time when I was a kid that had been made during the golden era of film, most of them black and white. And that actually was how I initially became interested in films. And the, the, the people who shot those movies were my heroes. And it's really, uh, and I was just obsessed with wanting to be one of them. That's how, how did that help? Anyway. Cool. So it looks like we have a question from our radio program. Yeah, we have a question from one of our listeners on Principia Internet Radio. He says, um, I've read a lot about how an aspiring screen screenwriter might attempt to break into Hollywood, but it would be very valuable to hear your perspectives on this challenge. Thank you, Jeff Brown from Dallas, Texas. Screenwriter. Wow. What do you think, darling? Just write a screenplay. I think it's the easiest way to get a job, honestly. Uh, if you write a screenplay, and, I mean, it's almost a joke in a way. I mean, it's, it's the hardest thing to do, and, but if you do it and you're four years old, you'll get a job. It, it's just, 
it's, it's, a, it's something you do all by yourself. It's been extraordinarily difficult. And we have a number of friends who are screenwriters. And it's alchemy when things all work out. But, uh, you know, you, you write by writing. Well, and any of you who see a lot of movies know that a really good story and a well-told story is kind of rare. So that's always a valuable commodity in Hollywood. And if you are someone who can write a compelling story, um, but, you know, I think his question goes beyond that. You, well, you know, you can't just send out scripts. Agents won't read unsolicited scripts. So there's always this catch-22. How do I get my script read? How do I, how do I make, you know, make it known to Hollywood that I've, read the, that I've written the best script ever? And that is, again, it's another catch-22 situation. And, um, well, there are people who read it. I mean, the, the whole business is replete with instances where somebody you've never heard of before wrote a screenplay that went into production. Well, it's, Ben it's Affleck a, and Will, uh, I mean, Ben Affleck and Matt what's his Damon. name? Matt, Matt Damon. Matt Damon. No, I mean, that's a, that's a big example. <laughs> Sorry. You've heard of them now, but, but nobody knew who they were. Years ago. But, but that is, in a strange way, it's the easiest thing to do and the hardest thing to do at the same yeah. time. Because uh, you have a great idea and you can't write, or you have a great idea and, you're, and you have half a screenplay or two-thirds of a screen. But it is, in a way, in a, in a sort of ironic way, it's the easiest way to find your way into the business. It's just, it's, a, it's just, it's, it's not something we, it's one of the hardest things to do. <laughs> we have a friend who's, Robert, as Robert said, we have a number of friends that are very successful screenwriters. And I was lamenting with her one time because her husband's a director. And whenever he's on location, she goes with him and she can still work. And when Robert and I are both working, we're in separate locations. We don't see each other for months. And I just said, you know, I wish there was something I could do. And she said, well, why don't you write? <laughs> As though anybody could write a screenplay. <laughs> it's not a very easy thing to do. Tony, Real talent. Tony Gilroy, who wrote Michael Clayton, and he wrote uh, Dolores Claiborne. And all the like Born Identity movies. All the Born Identity movies and like five other Taylor Hacker movies. He's one of the finest writers I know. He spent... Um, when he was 35 years old, he was a bartender. And For my old boyfriend. Yeah. We, found, and, uh, we just found that out. And um, I mean, he'd been trying to do this for a long, long, long time. And it, was, uh, it wasn't just a moment, but there was a moment when he finally found he was able to make a living at that. And he had mentors. He, had, he, he worked in New York. He had um, some limited success, but there was a moment when his life changed. And I think he was... I think he was like 35 or 36 years old, and up to then he had not been successful, and then he became more successful than almost anybody else. And now he's in this sort of one of a very small number of writers who get asked to do certain big movies. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Writing is kind of alchemy. I don't know how to even, if you can write. Sorry if we didn't answer your question very well. <laughs> Internet listener. Sorry. Good luck. Write a script. <laughs> okay. Don't send it to us. <laughs> The, uh, the structure of Hollywood has changed over the years. Studios were first independent, and they were part of conglomerates, et cetera, et cetera. And now you, you read about um, you know, studios only willing to make blockbusters, but then independent films like Slumdog Millionaire, Breakthrough, and what that. So kind of what's your perspective on kind of the way Hollywood is structured now in big film versus small film? You know, um, that very first film that I worked on, Mr. and Mrs. Bridge, the Newmans just said to me, do not leave law. You do not want to work in this. It's bottom line driven. It's all about making money. It's not what it used to be. It's not an art form anymore. And, and you know, they tried to discourage me like I discourage people, and I wasn't going to listen to it, so I, you know, ran off and joined the circus anyway. But I've come to learn that they were right. This is really a bottom line business for the most part. And so the movies that the studios make, there's a huge, vast calculation of how to get that movie made. The great news is, is that there are those independent filmmakers out there that make something like Slumdog Millionaire, and they make it for no money, and they become rich overnight because everybody races to see it. So it gives all the rest of us hope that we can do the same thing. And as long as there are, again, it goes back to the story. That's what the basis of, of everything is. If you've got a good story and you know how to tell it in a compelling way, people are going to come see it. So I think, and Robert, you, pro you may have a different view of this, but I think there's always going to be room for the independent filmmaker. 
But the studios, as long as they can make Titanic or, you know, uh, Iron Man or these movies that, and they have a very specific age range, age range that they're targeting, and it's basically from 14 to 17 years old, old boys. And as long as they've got that audience captured, then they will come back over and over and over to see those movies, and they make $400 million on them. They're going to keep doing those as well because mm -hmm. it's a business. But those studios in the past few years also, they love having a movie that's up for awards at, at award season. So they will make a Paul Thomas Anderson movie, even though none of Paul's movies really have made any money. But they've all been prestigious, so well, I, I can think, make um, a film. I think you can make any movie you want to make. I think that's one nice thing about what's going on now. I, I, it really is possible to do almost anything. Um, it, it really is. I mean, it's strange to say that because what, what the gentleman was saying is, is he's alluding to the fact that the, the studio structures, it's so expensive to market a movie and a film has to make so much money to recoup that, that unless there's a marketing idea behind it, it's very, very difficult for a studio to spend money. No matter what your movie, because if your movie costs a million dollars, it still costs $20 million to distribute it mm -hmm. with prints and ads. And advertising. So, it's it's such a difficult business at that area, and there and the, there's other differences now from what it was before. And I think one of the biggest differences is that there just this isn't a unified audience anymore. There's too many other things that people can do, other than go to the movies, and they can also look at media almost you know on a computer, um, video games. Actually, uh, everybody's very jealous in the movie business of the business that video games do, although they have no idea what what that means exactly. Uh, there's no business model to make the internet work for movies yet, and nobody knows if there ever will be. So there, there isn't all that. There, there are big, big bets that studios make when they make a movie that costs even 30 or 40 million dollars. Um, if you, but there are people who are willing to make those bets in smaller ways. I think you can actually make any any movie. It's the one time I think it's it's really true now. There. Probably right now, because of what's happened with the economy in general, there isn't any more crazy money out there. Um, I did a film prior to this. It was really a hedge fund money movie. It was done because uh, there was a hedge fund that put together 10 different movies, and uh, I think people invested in the hedge fund. And the prospectus was, we have a George Clooney movie. We have this, we have this, we have this. All that's gone. That's not going to happen. I think it's harder for studios to get money now, too. Um, but I still think it's the most exciting time because of all the different possibilities for outlets for distribution. And that's what's changing right now. And if kids in, in school right now are going to see the business change in a way um, that we nobody can even, even imagine. imagine or understand. But I think it's, you know, if, if 60 years ago or 70 years ago the studios could run these kinds of numbers and figure out all this stuff, they would have done it. They just couldn't. And now they can, so they do. So they have focus groups, and they have industry screenings, and they have all, this, they have all the ways that they figure out marketing. Um, it's always going to be that way. And I think it was always bottom line driven. It just is. It's too expensive and too risky and too much of an... I mean, it's other people's money. And it was always a business, even when it was you know, a, a romantic somehow, when they were making beautiful, wonderful, romantic movies in the 30s and 40s, they were also making an enormous amount of junk. They simply controlled the theaters, and they controlled the distribution. And it, it was a nice way of, um, I mean, you wouldn't be able to sit through 75% of the films made between 1930 and 1939. It's, it's not like they were all just magnificent works. There was the stuff that we hate now was, was the stuff that people hated then and made fun of. So it's, it's always been a mix. But I think now, because the, the technology is simpler and more accessible, that, for instance, Slumdog Millionaire, can be made in a way that it never could have made, be made even five years ago. And it changes the nature of the movie, and they've captured the imagination, and caught the culture. And you know that's always going to continue to happen. And someone in this room, someone in school here, will find <coughs> that sort of, will, will connect in that world in some way that we can't even, that I can't even imagine. I work with people who are very old fashioned and, and are still doing things the way they've been done since they invented movies. And one of them is, is Paul Anderson. I mean, he really is, even though he's very young, he's a Luddite. He won't go into a digital suite. He won't scan a movie. He won't pay. He never wants to go. He has a computer, sort of knows how to use it, but not really. 
Um, yeah, email. He doesn't do email. He doesn't even do email. I mean, yeah, it's like this. Uh, so uh, I don't know. I'm I'm th this next generation coming up with digital, uh, working in digital films or working with the computers. I think is going to change, but. The hard, as I, I said this earlier, the hardware isn't ever going to be a problem. The money might be a problem, but it's going to be cheaper and cheaper. Distribution is always going to be expensive, but it'll be less expensive. The problem is always going to be what Helen said. It's what the hell are you doing with it? It's the software. It's, uh, it's, there are more and more movies made, but they're not better movies made. They're, they're not better because they're hard to do. It's hard to make a good film, and it's hard to cast it right, and it's hard to come up with story ideas that are fresh and original. It's hard to do that stuff. And that's always going to be the commodity that people will be willing to pay money for. And if you can do that, then you'll find a way to work in the business. You really will. Tim. This is for both of you. Um, do you choose the projects, or do the projects choose you? And if you choose them, what are your criteria? <coughs> well. I don't choose the projects. I take whatever I can get. <laughs> Robert has a little bit more flexibility. It depends on, um, you know, it, well, it depends on if you remodeled your house recently. <laughs> depends on, um, I, I have friends who have kids in private school and need braces, things like that. So sometimes people make calculated choices that way. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's always different. I mean, where I am now, it's, I'm very lucky because Everybody who does what I do ends up with a period of time maybe in their career where they're sought after more than at other times. And this happens to be a time for me. And this was like when Vilmos Sigmund was my age. That's what he was doing. And now Vilmos Sigmund can't buy a job. And he's still the same cinematographer. I shouldn't say that he can't buy a job. I mean, he can buy a job. But I mean, it's just that people go through it's a snobby, trendy, moment by moment business that. Um, exaggerates people's skills and abilities because of reasons that don't have anything to do with what they're really capable of. And people become hot and then they don't. And that's probably less true for cinematographers than for actors, for instance, but it's still part of the business. So um, as I age gracefully, I'll probably become less, and less attractive to people. Um, but that's just and, the and way it goes. And I'd, I'd say it also has something, at least for me, to do with um, I, the people that I work with. I tend to work with the same producer. I've worked with him over and over because we have a relationship and we have a rapport. And so it's not so much that um, I, I mean, I would never say to him, no. Uh, he, he could, he, this is the one who asked me if I'd do the visual effects. And I would do anything for Duncan. He could ask me to, you know. That is something that's true. I mean, the, the truth of that, too, is that. Sometimes someone you like working with and really have a great relationship with asks you to do something that's really stupid or you don't want to do. And you end up doing it anyway because it's, it really is about personal relationships and not, not about, you know, I'm not talking about just to try to stay friends with someone. I'm just saying that those are the, that's just the way the business is in a personal way. You, you're, you're, the, your friends are oftentimes people you work with. You know, I, um, I've done like four movies with George Clooney. He's not a friend of mine. I have no personal relationship with him. But I've ended up working with him in different ways, just as an actor and as a director. And, uh, and it's come about in, in all sorts of different ways, but it's not um, something I, I would have a hard time saying no to him for all sorts of reasons I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit. But one of them is like, would he ever call me again? You know, it's kind of like that. And, and uh, if I did, and it was sort of an accident that I first started working with him. But, you know, he called me to do something really stupid, and I kind of said yes. And, uh, and thank God it fell through. <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, you know, th those things happen too. So I don't know. It's a mix of things, really. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if, if, you, if you don't instigate the project, if you're doing what I do, and you're waiting, I don't, I don't, nobody calls me on the phone until it's already a movie until there's already financing, and there's already sort of a cast, and everything's gone going. And then I'll get a phone call, and they'll say, are you interested in doing so-and-so? And, -so? and, and uh, there might be more than one choice, but I, I, th then it's, well, you know, it's interesting. And, and when I, Helen really, really, she read the script to Boogie Nights. And 
she really I thought with him not that to I do it. that I should not do the movie. I pleaded with him not to do and it. And I, you know, I done. He changed his life. I done well. I done a movie with Paul before, and I liked Paul a lot. And I and I understood because I knew him. I understood what he was really trying to do. The script was really graphic, and strange, and but Paul is Paul's films are always um, grounded in something that I think is really fascinating. He he makes movies about families. All his movies are essentially about the relationships with people within a family group. It's either they create, or they find, or they look for, or they throw what they have away and they find another one. But every one of his movies is essentially that. It's about a family in crisis, or a family coming together or falling apart, and the nature of all those relationships in complicated ways. And it's about, it's about, it's not husbands and wives as much as fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, it's all of that. And that's what I saw in Boogie Nights, because I knew it. And so I could read that script and say, you know, it isn't about naked people and it isn't about pornography and it isn't an exploitative movie. It really is a, you know what, it, what, what Boogie Nights was, and this is, goes back to my film school education, funny way, I just thought of it. Um, I knew what it was. It was, a, it was an American backstage musical. It was 42nd Street. It was um, uh, Gold Diggers of 1933. What it was was it was about a bunch of people who get together and put on a show. And instead of Ruby Keeler and William Warren Williams and uh, um, uh, Una Merkel, he had, you know, Burt Reynolds and all these other people. And that's that movie. That movie literally is a remake of Broadway Melody of 1934, or whatever the hell those Busby Berkeley shows were. Except instead of making a Broadway musical, they're making a porno movie. And it's a little more complicated than that, but that's what that film was. So it was actually after Boogie Nights, which I, I ultimately did love. Um, it was after that that I decided I was not going to advise Robert on his career anymore. No, <laughs> so I can't. She advised him. But you know, um, more. I, I think a more particular answer, maybe Tim, to your question is: Robert and I both work as freelance technicians, but neither one of us you know, hears of a film and goes out and seeks, you know, a job on that film. So we're both usually nope. approached with, you know, an offer to do a film and we either take it in my case or we consider it and take it or turn it down in Robert's. But, um, but we don't really go out and say, oh, I hear that there's a George Clooney movie in St. Louis this summer and can I get on that movie? That's because work comes to us in different ways. That I haven't gotten, and and uh, and wanted to do, and, and I, for some reason, in the worst way, I wanted to do my best friend's wedding, and. Uh, you did. Yeah, and. Uh, <laughs> and I remember this very well because I I was one of the I had a horrible interview, and I didn't get the movie, and uh, but but uh, it was a while ago, but still the, those things happen. I mean, um, I I wanted to do doubt, uh, actually. You were but, offered but I couldn't do it because I had a conflict. But uh, I ended up being, you know, it's just, it's, it's sort of a strange series of accidents sometimes. <clears throat> but, but, but Helen's right, we don't initiate. It's one of the sad things about what we do. We, we're sort of sitting there waiting for someone to call us, you know. So we have somebody out here, I'm sure I hope will someday call me. And I'm available. Yeah. Very cheap. Well, first, thank you very much for the gift of your work to the world there. It's a <laughs> remarkable gift to a very wide, wide thank audience. I have a big question, a little question. The big question goes back to where Helen started about the spiritual intuition about that voice. And I wonder if you could share a story about translating spiritual vision into something that actually uh, ended up in a movie, something that made a difference in your work. And the little question is on behalf of our physics and math majors. When we watched Michael Clayton last week, I wasn't uh, ready for the explosion behind him. But tonight I was, and I noticed that the delay, about half a second, was exactly right for the difference in the speed of light and the speed of sound coming from the car. And I wonder if you hire physicists or mathematicians that actually vet the movies, <laughs> that actually go through and say, because I've seen some movies that don't do those things very well, and some movies where they're, uh, they're spot on with the physics. And just wonder if you hire physicists and mathematicians to uh, have a look to make sure they're plausible. Well, I'll let Helen do the spiritual question. 
while you're thinking of that, thinking of that. Um, how you're going to get out of that one. No, it's a, it's a valid question. I, I'm going to alter your question a little bit, Tom, because um, I don't, I mean, I think what you're asking is, has spiritual intuition somehow manifested itself in a film that I've worked on? And the answer is yes and no. Um, that, went, that very first visual effects film that I did, uh, Outbreak, you know, I had a moral decision to make on that film, and, and am I going to help create something that basically makes people fearful about germs and disease? And as a Christian scientist, I had a, a problem with that. And I, you know, it, it was so early in my film career that I could rationalize and say, how can I say no to this man who became my mentor in the, in the business? And I felt led to him. Uh, and to that relationship, and how you know how can I say no? I'll never get work again. And I took the I took the project obviously. And on that film, there was another Christian Scientist. I, you know, I run into Christian Scientists all over the film business. It's amazing. On the perfect story, I mean, on the River Wild where I met Robert, there were five of us. And it's a great story. Someday I'll tell you about how we all found each other. But on Outbreak, my friend Cece and I, you know we would be surrounded by, the makeup was phenomenal on that movie. They, I mean, they would spend an hour in makeup in the morning and they would come with these growths on their face because this disease had a very quick growing fungus that would, I mean, it was just awful. And so we would spend all morning with them shooting and just being around this. And then we would break for lunch and we would all go to lunch together, and we'd be sitting down, and there's this guy with his stuff all over his face having, you know, a cheeseburger, and you're sitting right next to him, you're talking. And Cece and I looked at each other, and we thought, this is a fabulous metaphor for what we believe, because it's so clearly not real. It's just a movie. And I think my spiritual intuition led me to something that has proven to be a, a lifelong lesson for me. I mean, I use that metaphor all the time when I'm trying to see through the reality of what the mortal senses are trying to tell us. So, but I, you know, spiritual intuition has led, I just feel so guided and, and led in my life that um, I, I could go on for hours about that. So, Robert, back to the math question. Um. That's good. Um, the guy who directed Michael Clayton is a real stickler for um, doing things accurately, and it really was him. I mean, uh, Tony Gilroy researched uh, just the, the mechanics of what happens in the movie in terms of the law and all that other stuff, that the complicated storytelling and the, the nature of what it means to hide a document and discovery and do all that stuff. It was something that he, he's a stickler for creating a, a reality that uh, a lot of directors I've worked with just aren't, up to the point of insisting that when George Clooney drives his son to school, that we had to drive down West End Avenue because that's where all the private schools are. Like, even though it was a nightmare to shoot on that street. Because you all know that, right? That's where all the private Nobody schools are. Nobody knows that. Or if we were looking uptown instead of downtown, or if there was a subway entrance and somebody was going to get in it, it had to be, it, 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 it's in all this way. So, and he's very conscious of sound, and sound design in a movie is a big, big part of filmmaking now. It always has been, but even more so now because they can trick it out. And every and, and we actually did an explosion. And what you're hearing, because the microphone, it was one of the one of the one of the, one of the jobs on movies that people don't that aren't that aware of necessarily. The location sound recorders and a guy named Mike Borowski is the location sound recorder on on that movie and a number of other movies, is I think one of those brilliant people in the movie business. And he did the location sound for that, which was a microphone near the camera. There was a real explosion. There was no horse there, by the way. The horse was actually shot against the green screen Vision and added effect. later. Um, the, the horse could not be there when there was an explosion. So we, there was no horse, there was just Clooney. The explosion went off, and Borowski recorded the sound from the camera perspective, which was delayed. And then they actually slightly exaggerated it because they thought it would even be more compelling. And then they put, you know, we, we photographed the horse and the horse was composited and added later and it moved at the site of the explosion and not the sound. So it was, it was thought through and it was very, very, but no, there, I don't, as far as I know, there were no scientists. There were a number of lawyers. <laughs> 
but no scientists. And uh, by the way, that whole idea, for those of you who are interested, was based on, the whole idea for Michael Clayton grew out of Tony reading an article about Kenneth Starr um, when he was representing General Motors, hiding a document in Discovery about the rupturing gas tanks on the rollover trucks. I don't know if anybody remembers the case, but Kenneth Starr held this document out of Discovery for five years while he shopped this case around. And when it finally went to trial and the document came out, it was one of those, um, what do you call them? Uh, 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 you know, uh, smoking gun? No, well, it was a smoke, it was a knife in the heart of the case, but it was, a, it was the uh, cost benefit analysis study that an engineer had done. It'll cost this much money to fix the car. It'll just cost this much money if we kill this many people and have to litigate. What do you want to do? That was the document. So he hid that. When it finally came out, this is the guy who's dean of Pepperdine, by the way, and who prosecuted Bill Clinton, for those of you who don't know who Kenneth Starr is, in the, in the, uh, who investigated Whitewater and came up with Monica Lewinsky. That's Kenneth Starr. So well, this guy held this, they said, oh, it's okay, but I'm, I'm digressing, I know. But anyway, so, uh, so he keeps this document out of discovery five years, and he gets, you know, he's, so Tony took this idea, and he thought, this is how movies sort of come into being, he thought, I want to have some document like that, I want to have a case like that, I want to have something, and I want the lawyer, instead of being Kenneth Starr, I'm gonna have the lawyer be a manic depressive who essentially goes crazy and decides he can't live in that culture anymore and he's going to blow the whole thing up. But the movie isn't about that. The movie is about a man who has to save his own life because he's essentially lost his moral compass and he doesn't have a, a sort of, he, has, he doesn't know who he is anymore and he's lost himself. And so the catalyst for that was, this is interesting, I, I really like this because it's sort of about um, the moral issue of the movie and what movies are about, really about something. And that movie really is about something. It's just a very sort of complicated arrangement to get there. But because he's that kind of writer, it was really important to him that when that car blew up, that it be completely scientifically accurate, if that makes any sense. Anyway, so that's, oh. And I, yeah, I just love talking about Kenneth Starr. Like that. <laughs> cool. Randy? All right. Um, first of all, I, I would like to thank um, both of you uh, for coming tonight and give us uh, some really insightful experience. And I, I just, I have two questions, um, which essentially is the same, but one more general and one is more um, specific. Um, so how often do you see people who jump from, like for example, as in your case, um, one, one path, one career path to another and become successful. And my more specific question is, um, when I heard about some actor name that's not, that's I never heard of, uh, first thing I usually do is to check it on Wikipedia. And, and um, apparently I have encountered some people who who, who, who came from a visual effects and become an actor afterward. So um, my specific question is, how often do you see that um, from your observation experience um, and, uh, and still become successful? You mean start as something other than an actor? Yes, um, yeah, especially people who, has, um, who came from film school or, um, but not limited to. Well, Helen started in a completely different career. Or two Path, or three. Or three. Helen is, a, Helen is um, wh one, of, one of the things that impressed me the most when I finally learned as much as I kind of know about Helen was that she, and maybe this has to do with being a Christian scientist, I think it does, and growing up in the way she grew up, was that she has never ever been afraid of just deciding it, there was a certain moment that she was simply not going to do this anymore. She was going to get jump up, turn around 180 degrees, and go over there and do that. And that takes an enormous amount of courage, and you have to believe deep down inside that ultimately everything is going to be okay. You really have to believe that or you can't live your life that way. And so Helen was just, has done so many different things and lived in so many different places because she inside simply knows that it's going to be okay, that she'll find a way and I don't believe that at all, you know. You do I, I, I mean, no, but I mean, I, that's, I'm not somebody who doesn't believe it, but I mean, I, I, I see that as such an extraordinary 
thing to strive for in life. And you know, I'm somebody who, I still live in the house I grew up in, right? I've always lived, I've never, I've never really gone anywhere, and I'm essentially doing the same thing I was doing when I was 10 years old. Oh, you're so, so unadventurous. It's, no, it's true. But I mean, it's, that's, there, there, it's, it's a big difference. And I think, I'm not sure if that's answering the question, but I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to think of anybody else who started well, like you. You're, Helen's really unique. I, I, to start as a, law, to, to be a Wall Street lawyer at Stimson, White, Button, and Roberts, and then find, I mean, and then find, <laughs> and then find yourself at, at, in a visual, I mean, it's, it's kind of astonishing, actually. I think he kind of likes me, but. Well. I think, you know, really, it's not just in our industry that people are, are doing that. I mean, you all, nobody stays at the company for their whole life anymore. People are changing their jobs and their professions all the time. So I think it's not just in our business that, and actually that producer that gave me that job um, and said, oh, you went to law school, you can figure it out. He was a stockbroker until he was 30. And then he decided this isn't what I want to do and he started over as a assistant director on a film set. So he also had changed his life, but you know, my brother, one of my brothers was a banker until he was 40 years old and decided he wanted to go back to art school. So he went to Kansas City and went to the Art Institute and now he's a very successful sculptor. And I think it's happening everywhere. I think it's not just... Um, well, you know. nobody, I mean, we have friends in their, in their 50s who have worked at the same company for a long time and, um, be, and they're downsized and, and, and we have friends who, you know, the, the very successful executive life that they've lived. And, there is no job anymore. And I, I, I'm always, um, what we end up having to do is every six or eight months, we have to reinvent ourselves. I mean, that is the scariest thing. There really is no uh, guaranteed employment in what we do. There is no company, there's no place to go. I mean, there really is just the, na you know, it's, uh, it's Willie Loman in a way. I mean, we're just out there with a, as they used to say, with a shoe shine and a smile. and. At some point, it wears thin, and you know you end up like Willie Loman. Hopefully, it's going to be a few years from now. But that's really where it is. And and but who would think that that was a more successful way to to, to sort of run your life than going to work at uh, Pearson, you know, for 25 years and getting to be a senior vice president, and then finding at 55 years old they didn't want to pay you $350,000 anymore because they just can't afford it, and you're not going to find that job again. And so, I mean, I never thought of any of these things, but I'm sort of watching people my age now who have different career paths. And the people in the movie business, it's very unsettling. It's not something you can do because there really are no, there are no studio jobs. There's no, at least in the creative end, there's no word B um, that guarantees you a job or employment or anything. So you're really kind of out there a little bit. And I think that yeah. is the hardest thing for people to adjust to. It's the hardest thing for friends of mine who, when we got out of school and found themselves in that world, it was just too daunting. And I think also it, it helps, and I'm not sure if kids here have this. I was very lucky, I had parents. I had, a, I had a, my grandmother, who I was raised by my grandma, was very, very supportive and believed that there was a, because my family had been theatrical agents, that there was a show business, was, it was a viable way of making a living. It wasn't, it wasn't like joining the circus or going to work in a whorehouse, which other friends of mine experienced from their parents. It was film school, it was like, what are you doing? I mean, what is that? I mean, it, it is kind of a leap because there is no, you have to invent your own job. So it's true in all the arts, but especially I think uh, scary for parents who are spending I don't want to say how much money, but sending their kids to school for four years and they come out and they're, they're art history majors and they want to go in the film business and then what do you do? I mean, so uh, it, it helps to have that kind of support because there's periods of time, especially when you're starting out, you won't work or you'll get very, very little money for what you do and you have to stick with it. Okay, we're going to take these two questions and then wrap things up. Oh, okay. great. Okay. Cool. Let's start over here. I have a question about camera technique. I noticed a trend that began a few years ago to bring the camera ever closer to the actor's face, especially during dialogues. <laughs> uh, extreme close-ups, where mm. you can literally count the pores in their skin, and in some movies it sits there for mm -hmm. minutes. It feels very unnatural to me, uh, especially being overused. 
Uh, I've seen some recent movies where there should have been an incredibly powerful or strong moment, and it just begged for a grander shot, yet there was the camera stuck at an apparent distance of nine inches away from their face. Uh, I wonder if you can tell us where this trend came from. Is it being, yes, I can. Is it being taught to people as they come into the industry? Here's how you do a good dialogue shot. It's, it's really one of the things that drives me crazy, too, and I think it makes us very, you know, we're very old-fashioned. And an interesting thing, Paul uh, doesn't do that. Paul Anderson doesn't, doesn't or that we certainly do. I don't know if everybody understands that question, but if you, if you look at old movies especially, the movies of the 30s and 40s, and you look at the way they're staged and photographed, there's much more of um, a sort of, um, you, you're standing back a little bit and you're actually seeing wider shots of people. You see their body language, they interact, and the takes last longer. There isn't a constant cutting rhythm that moves you from one side of the set to the other over and over and over again. And there are very, very, very few close-ups. And I remember seeing with uh, a very good friend of mine who's a director, uh, we went to see, uh, she wore a yellow ribbon. It was a new print that was made at UCLA and we sat through the movie. I don't know if you know, it's a John Wayne Western made by John, directed by an amazing director named John Ford, shot in 1948. It's a fabulous color movie. It's a very old movie, 1948. And we sat through the film and about an hour into it, in the middle of the film, John Wayne goes to see some Indians at a camp to try to talk them out of doing something. And there's a close up of John Wayne. It's a shot like this and it cuts into his hat. And both of us kind of reared back because we realized up to that moment, we had never seen a close-up in that movie. There hadn't been one. But John Ford, and, and it is a lost art, could stage a film, moving camera to some extent, but it's, it's just not done that way anymore. And I think it's a variety of reasons. I think uh, the scripts aren't, aren't, in many instances, really people don't trust the scripts and trust the actors. And it's just easier to shoot coverage and shoot close-ups and put your movie together in the editing room than to try and stage something that's complicated and has to work while you're standing there on the set. It's very, very, it's, it's tricky. It's hard to do. And if you watch um, all the old, you know, the, the people who made movies, also it's, it's the technologies allowed us to do it too. Films are, are, you know, you can make more setups now, you can work more quickly, there's longer lenses, faster film. So it's a combination of all of that. But I think it is, it's a style that relates also to television a little bit. Television changed uh, pictorial style in movies simply because the screen's smaller. And now people are looking at movies on their nanos, you know, so it doesn't work. And don't you think also, darling, that it has something to do with the audience attention span? I think the, cutting, gotten, I think the cutting pattern you know, might, but it, it certainly has changed enormously. And I think, uh, in fact, somebody did a count of how many cuts there are in modern films, like how many actual just shots, you know, one after the other. And somehow There Will Be Blood came in so down at the bottom that it wasn't even on the scale. It's something like, I can't remember the total number, but I think it's like 260 as opposed to 1,000. Some extraordinary difference between the average. And it really is, it's about energy and pace and the fear of an audience um, losing interest or being bored. And Haven't you all seen those trailers when you go to the movies and it's like... <laughs> And but, you're but, trying but, to figure out what the action is that you're supposed to be watching. But even in a straight dialogue film, I think if you sat through Shanley's Doubt and you saw those scenes, it's, it's essentially people talking. You know, movies are people talking in rooms. You know, and they're just standing there and they're talking. There's three people and they're sitting in a chair and they're having a conversation. And how do you shoot that and make it compelling? And it's, it's staging a movie for the camera and moving people through space and having it have some interest and have it mean something and not just be self-conscious is it's what directors do. And there aren't a lot of people who do it well. It's hard. And it's, mm -hmm. it's a creatively complicated, and you're interacting with actors who sometimes don't want to help do that, and they're more comfortable shooting close-ups. So it's, it's all those things, and I, I feel bad about it too. And I know that, I mean, we started, it's interesting, we started Michael Clayton saying we were gonna imitate films from the 70s, which uh, Alan Pakula movies shot by Gordon Willis like Clute, and we were gonna stand back and watch things and observe them from a distance and not play medium close-ups. And what happened to us, on that movie was Tony and I kind of both fell in love with, with kind of George Clooney's close-up. Because it's, he really, there's something, he's such, and it's not what he, it's, what, it's George Clooney is, is one of his great gifts is reacting. It's watching him listen to somebody, watching him watch another actor or listen to another actor. It's incredibly compelling. So there's these, that scene, 
in the beginning of the movie where he's at the house of the guy who ran the kid over and you know and they're having an argument. There must be, you know, we thought of that when we thought through the movie that, that this would all be in, in kind of mediums and we'd have it play and the space would play and these were great actors. It was Dennis, o Dennis O'Hare and George Clooney and it was gonna be. And we ended up making like, you know, 25 setups and it's all like this and it's like, I, I don't know. I mean, I just, I think it's the way scripts are written. I think it's that actors don't come out of the theater anymore. Uh, they can't sustain a performance. They can't do six pages of dialogue without something going wrong. And if you want to see a great, great scene in a great comedy and a great movie that lasts for six pages in one camera setup, you should rent Sullivan's Travels. It's the opening shot of the movie. It's seeing um, uh, three actors walk out of a screening room and do six pages of dialogue that is snappy and funny and bright and the camera never stops moving and it doesn't call attention to itself and you don't know how they, now it's mad. No one could ever, ever do that now. No one could write that script and no one could have actors who'd been on Broadway for 30 years and come to Hollywood and play that scene with Joel McRae and be that funny and that brilliant and that sharp and that witty. Um, it's a lost part of filmmaking, unfortunately, for most people anyway. Okay, final question. All right, so that's really loud. Um, you, earlier while you were talking about there, there will be blood, um, you alluded to this idea that you would, uh, there's this one scene, the, the, the explosion scene that didn't really go as you, as you had seen it. Um, you had this vision and it just didn't turn out that way because you had maybe one time to, to record it. And as an, as an artist, how does, that, how does that make you feel and does that happen often and is it, is it something that drives you nuts? Well, as I started way? to say, it's really, it's a unique thing for Paul. Paul wants, you know what, uh, there's a whole approach to, to, to filmmaking that Paul embraces, which is very different for most people. He doesn't want to control what happens on the set. He wants accidents to happen. He wants things to go wrong. He wants the wall to fall down. He really wants some, something. He, think, he knows that it's going to, he wants life to break out. And you can't always control that. And so he, 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 t he tends towards pushing things too far and he has a great relationship with actors, so they're willing to trust him and let things go on and on and shooting endlessly and things. And he's, he's just, he, he knows he'll always, even if he has a preconceived idea of what he wants it to be, that it's gonna get better, that he's gonna end up trading up, you know? And there are lots of directors who can't do that. They won't embrace that. They want a controlled environment and they don't wanna be surprised and they don't want something to happen that they aren't expecting. And nobody I know would ever, ever set that thing on fire knowing that they couldn't put it out, ever. And, and he just did. And uh, he's, nobody can control them, really. I mean, there's no real producer. He's a little incorrigible. And, uh, and, uh, and, and part of what I would do in that situation is just make sure that we had enough cameras that we could photograph it in a way that you could edit it together later and feel that what probably should have been shot over three nights, because the whole thing burns down in like 15 minutes. Um, and it turns into night, and it was supposed to be magic hours, all this. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's not frustrating. You know what it is? It, I found Paul frustrating for about two or three years. And then I realized that what I'd learned from Paul was that exactly what I was saying before, which is it's very humbling to, to understand that um, it's, it's, about, uh, it's about not controlling things. It's about having things come to life in ways that you don't expect. And if you try to manicure everything, and you try to control, if you try to make it, you know, just try to just gourmet it up, you end up with, with still life. You end up with, with things that don't interest me. Um, you know, lots of people think of them as well-made movies. Um, you know, Paul isn't interested in that world. And, and it's kind of refreshing and it's wonderful to be around. And I'm very lucky I'm a part of that. Um, and very, very few other directors are, are comfortable with that. They really aren't. It's because it, there's too many unknowns, as, as Donald Rumsfeld would say. Okay. Thank you very much both for talking to us. Thank you. It's fun. Thank you. Thank you.